When Lionel Richie was born on the 20th of June, 1949, the murder and oppression of black people was still commonplace in America's southern states. And his hometown of Tuskegee, Alabama, was at the heart of the struggle for civil rights. It was the birthplace of Rosa Parks, whose refusal to give up her bus seat to a white man in 1955 sparked a revolution. The Tuskegee Airmen, the country's first black air squadron, were based near the town. And as well as seeing action in the Second World War, they led the fight against racism in the U.S. Armed Forces. And in 1966, when Lionel was still at high school, a student from the Tuskegee Institute named Samuel Young Jr. was murdered for using a whites-only restroom following a civil rights march in neighboring Montgomery. It would have been an incredible time to witness the kinds of things that were going on with regard to race relations in the South. Tuskegee is unique because it's a place that had an unusually large number of African-American professionals, and this allows educated black people to mobilize and actually offer an eloquent response to white oppression. Lana was raised in the leafy surroundings of the Tuskegee Institute campus. His father was a retired army captain, and his mother taught at the local school. Together they lived in this house, along with Lionel's sister and grandmother. Being middle class most certainly affected Lionel Richard. His understanding of what he could be was going to be completely different than most black people in the South. Two great things happened in my life. Number one, I had a great family, a great support group, lots of love. <laughs> And secondly, I was born and raised on a university campus, Tuskegee University. Founded in 1881, shortly after the end of the American Civil War, Tuskegee Institute was built on the site of a former plantation and established specifically for the education of African Americans. The most wonderful thing about being from Tuskegee, it was the foremost of everything that you had to have an education. In Linus' position, his family could afford to send him to college. You had to have that want to go on to be a better person. You just didn't stop. You had to go on. This university accomplished things that were not uh, attainable at the time. Whatever you could dream, you could make that a reality. So reaching for the stars was, was, was not out of the realm. That was just part of his being. When Lionel took the short walk down the road to the Institute in September 1968, he was to study economics, apparently on a tennis scholarship. Who told you that? <laughs> uh, he got a tennis scholarship. Somebody bought it for him. I won't say anything. Go ahead, on. <laughs> Whatever the extent of his sporting prowess, it wasn't tennis or economics that grabbed Lionel's attention. It was music. Although his grandmother, a classically trained pianist, had tried to teach him to read music, she'd long lost patience. It was just not in my realm, but I could listen to everything and play what I heard. Finally, one day, I played from beginning to end, and she said, you're not reading music. And I said, yes, I am. And she says, no, you're not. I didn't turn the page. Undeterred, Lionel refused to let his lack of formal training stand as a barrier to the kind of music he wanted to make. He formed a band with five fellow students, swapped his racket for the sax, and the Commodores were born. One idea in a life, I was to become this great lawyer, settle down, get married, have kids, and be a respectable person. I showed up at my house with five guys with afros and braids and rollers in their hair, and they were talking some crazy nonsense about, we're going to take over the world. We had our eyes on the prize, and that was doing our music, hoping one day that we would get a record deal. That's right. And, but we set out to do one thing other bands wasn't doing. They were not doing shows. With a set list of covers, the student band was soon picking up gigs off campus. During the summer, we would leave Tuskegee and go up to New York. 18-hour drive. I remember it like it was yesterday. 
And we would enjoy getting lost along the way, especially if I was driving. You're bound to get lost. Where are we in Texas? <laughs>